This is Linda Rose, Spirit Song. And before I start this, what I'm going to sh about to share with you, I have titled it His Appointed Times of Prayer, a beautiful, inspiring commentary on Psalm 19.2, and a new song by an anonymous sister in Christ. But before I begin this, this journey, I'm going to pray. Abba, Father, I come to you in the name of Yeshua. I thank you for the way that you speak to each and every one of our hearts in this time, in this day, in this hour, the urgency of those things that you want us to bring forth before your children, your people, the revelations that you're giving to us, the words that you're giving, you're, you have been giving to us, and all these things that you want us to know that will help prepare us for these times that you have called that we are in right now. I ask, God the Father, that you prepare every heart who will hear this word, that they would receive it, that whatever needs to be removed in their hearts, their minds, and their lives, that would keep this word from going down into their into the depths of their being, that you would move those things out of the way. Because I know this is something, there is a mystery here that you have revealed and you have shown me. And I want to be able to share that which you put on my heart to share with your people. More things that we need to do to enter into greater discipline in these times of fasting or on a regular basis. On the ways in which you would have us pray and how we can pray without ceasing and getting into your word, and hiding your word in our hearts so we will not sin against you, and to be able to be raised up higher and higher in you through praise and worship, which is the highest frequency of coming, Father, of coming from the, the ways and the cares and snares of the world and rise up where you are seated upon your throne, and that we can come and enter in into your holy of holies, into your presence by the blood of Yeshua by his torn flesh, that veil that we can enter in through your precious blood. So I ask, Holy Spirit, that you take over these lips, this tongue, everything that you want spoken, the scriptures you want read, and all that you have revealed by the power and authority of your name and in the name of Yeshua, I declare it done. By faith, your will be done. As I was praying, spending time with the Father this past Friday morning, I was uh, reading in Acts chapter 10. And um, what happened with, um, with Peter, with Cornelius and Peter, I'm going to go ahead and read that account with you and where that led me where the Holy Spirit wanted me to go after he after I read this it is in uh, Acts chapter 10 I will read the account of Peter's vision the next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour then he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened up in an object like a great sheet, bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air, and a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But Peter said, No, master. For I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice, voice spoke to him again a second time. What Elohim has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times. And the object was taken up into heaven. So there, think about that number three and what he's laying out, and what he was revealing to me as I was reading this. Then we read Cornelius. What, so in verse, this is now going to be in Acts 10, starting in verse 30. 
So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of Elohim. Send therefore to Joppa, and call Simon Peter, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon a tanner by the sea, and when he comes he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore we are all present before Elohim to hear all the things commanded you by Elohim. And I said, Father, it just, it jumped out at me, brothers and sisters. I said, what is this with this, the sixth hour, with the ninth hour? What are you saying? There's something here. There's a mystery here. There's something that we have not been, as your people, have not been accustomed to what this really means. And I was led, and I, I did a search about the, because I know, um, and Daniel, it talks about Daniel praying three times a day. And then it is mentioned throughout scripture about the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour. And when I went to do a search, of course, those times, is, the third hour is 9 a.m., the sixth hour is 12 noon, and the ninth hour is 3 p.m. I was led to a website, and um, I just knew after reading it that this is what the Holy Spirit wanted me to share with you all about the hours of prayer. It is by um, Bob Somerville, and this, this is what he wrote. Peter, Jane, Peter and John went together into the temple at the hour of prayer. Perhaps you have never considered it. There are specific hours of the day ordained of Elohim, which Memorial Day of the week for corporate worship, together with annual days of celebration. He also ordained special hours of the day for prayer to bring particular honor to himself. The three biblical memorial hours of prayer are specifically the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour of the day. Now, I've already told you what those times were. These were important prayer disciplines faithfully observed by the Old Testament saints and the New Testament believers by our Lord Yeshua Messiah. The hours of prayer were continually honored because they were divinely appointed. The practice of observing them is being restored to the prayer of these appointed prayer times to the body of Messiah. The apostles of Yeshua, knowing the vital role that prayer plays in the believer's spiritual life, were willing students requesting of Yeshua, Master, teach us to pray. Since we are living in the times of restoration and renewal of the body of Messiah, the practice of honoring the biblical hours of prayer, quote unquote, can be another enriching element of restoration in the body of Messiah to bring new life. These memorial hours of prayer are elements of perfected worship for reasons that we shall explore. Needless to say, Prayer is an essential element to the Yahuwah and man relationship. For this reason, Elohim said that his assembly shall be called a house of prayer. Isaiah 56, verse 7. Prayer is more important than faith. Let's qualify that by saying that they are interdependent. However, the rewards much more succinctly by saying ask and you shall receive. Over the years, we have been inundated with how-to books on how to live out our faith. Books on prayer have been no, ex no exception. Indeed, there have been some great books written about the meaning of prayer, proper methods, purposes, and many critiques on, quote-unquote, the Lord's Prayer. However, the importance of 
nor the biblical concept of having daily hours of prayer have yet been adequately addressed. It is one of those references in the scripture that we often read over without really reading. Let us examine it. And I have to say yes to that, beloved, because I have been one of those ones who have been reading it over, reading over it without even considering what does this mean? We don't have time to be glancing and glossing over things that are being revealed and given to us in these last days. And I believe this is very important. These specific hours of prayer are an integral part of Yahweh's divine prayer system. Considering our modern day propensity for random religion or extemporaneous spirituality cloaked with such pious phrases as when I feel inspired, quote unquote, some tend to shy away from anything that smacks of discipline, order, and regulation fearing the ravages of ritualism and or legalism. When it is true that we should quote unquote pray without ceasing, the fact is that most of us do not. Yahuwah knows the human spirit and its intrinsic need for discipline. It is this condition that accounts for his need to introduce some systematic or regulating elements into the worship order and prayer life of his people. The spiritual life is very similar to the natural life, in that if it is not given some guidance and programming, it will soon fall into negligence and disarray. And that programming, we're not talking about the programming of the world, but we do have things that we need to, that needs to be instilled into us, the, the Father's people that needs to be a part of our life, those disciplines that will bring us into this kind of um, prayer life that we all need to increase and grow into, especially with these times that we find ourselves in. In the Old Testament era, the hours of prayer were also known as the hours of oblation or sacrifice. Daniel 9, 21, 2 Kings 16, 15, it is recorded that the prophet Daniel prayed three times a day. That You will read that in Daniel 6, 10. Daniel did not pray three times a day just because he felt strangely inspired, quote unquote, to do it. He prayed three times a day because it was part of his godly heritage. It was a meaningful component of his daily prayer life. All this, although this prayer practice was established in the Old Testament, as it rightly should be, Hebrews 10.1, it is more often mentioned in the New Testament, these hours of sacrifice or hours of prayer, particularly the third and ninth hours, were prophetic in nature. Yeshua, our supreme sacrifice, was crucified in the third hour of the day, Mark 15, 25. His witness of, quote-unquote, darkness at noonday occurred in the sixth hour, Mark 15, 33 through 34, and Matthew 27, 45. Finally, at the time of evening oblation being the ninth hour, Yeshua gave up his spirit and died for the sins of the world, Luke 23, 44 through 46. These hours of prayer are memorials of him who made it possible for you and me to enter the holiest of holies, spiritually for, our, for ourselves coming boldly before the throne of Yahweh Elohim in prayer, making our petitions known, Hebrews 10:19. What greater motive would the believers need for recognizing and giving at least occasional honor to these hours of prayer than bringing honor to, Sh to Yeshua? The New Testament is filled with glorious accounts of how Elohim has honored these special hours by responding to prayer in a significant way. Here are some examples. It was the third hour on the Memorial Day of Pentecost when the 120 disciples were in the upper room praying for the promise of the Father when cloven tongues of fire sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. You will find that in Acts 2, 3, and verse 15. Not only was it the prophetic day, Pentecost, but also the prophetic hour. The New Testament believers customarily went to the temple at the hour of prayer. Evidence of this is revealed in the account of a miraculous event 
which occurred at a particular time when two disciples of Yeshua were entering the temple shortly after the day, the day of Pentecost. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Acts 3.1 On this occasion a lame man was gloriously healed. When the apostle Peter took him by the hand and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately his feet and ankles and bones received strength. That's in Acts 3, 6-7. They were not at the temple by happenstance, nor randomly entering the temple, but were very deliberately doing so at the hour of prayer. Not to be overlooked is the story of the Apostle Peter and Cornelius at Caesarea, Acts 10. In effect, it is, an, it is a reenactment of the day of Pentecost. The only major difference is that it was happening to a body of Gentiles, on this occasion rather than a body of, of, of the Jewish people, or Israelites, I will say. God began to set the stage for a dispensational change. The thrust of the gospel from this point on will be focused on the Gentile nations. The unique circumstances of the story were divinely orchestrated. Cornelius, though a soldier in the Roman army, was a devout man who prayed to Yahuwah always and was very liberal in his almsgiving. He was in prayer about the ninth hour when an angel of the Lord appeared to him in the next uh, in a vision and instructed him to send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, who was surnamed Peter. The next day, as Cornelius' servant came to Joppa, Peter also was having a spiritual experience. Peter went up the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Suddenly he fell in a trance and saw a vision of a great sheet laying, being let down from heaven, full of all kinds of unclean beasts. So Yahuwah proceeded to instruct Peter to accept these Gentiles because they had now been cleansed. It was simply an object lesson to prepare Peter for ministry to a people, Gentiles, whom he considered unacceptable for the kingdom of Elohim. His obedience to, to Yahweh resulted in a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the house and family of Cornelius and consequently the Gentile nations. It is obvious that observing the, the memorial hours of prayer was a vital part of the spiritual value system of both of these great men of Elohim. Secret. Let's see what we got here. Let's go ahead and read here where it talks about um, about leaving your gift. Another important dimension of prayer, which is coupled with hours of prayer related to our gifts or offerings. Yeshua spoke of this when instructing the disciples about acceptable prayer and practices. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar... And there remember that your brother hath ought against you. Leave there your gift before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. That's in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Secret closet. Finally, Yeshua, being coming from, from being a Jew, coming from the a tribe of, of Judah, and well acquainted with this biblical prayer system, no doubt, had the hours of prayer in mind when he taught his disciples the value of quote-unquote secret closet prayer. Public demonstrations of observing the hours of prayer to be seen of men is not recommended, although that would be better than none at all, if void of self-pride. Yeshua said, But you, when you pray, enter into your closet, and when you have shut your door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. That's Matthew 6, 6. Every believer should have a place set aside, whether it be in our home, on a mountain, or elsewhere. It is good to have a designated place to observe these hours of prayer. One's home is particularly important in this regard. One's home is particularly important in this regard. In their plan to build a new home, some believers are now including a special design room for use as a prayer chapel, a soundproof room where full disclosure can be made to Yahuwah and uninhibited, and un, uninhibited praise can be offered. When you see people being openly blessed of Elohim, you can reasonably be assured that there has been some activity in the secret prayer closet. With a designated prayer place, 
one tends to be more readily reminded and activated to a systematic prayer order in his life. Children of darkness are often wiser. The Mohammedans customarily pray five times a day. The first prayer is performed in the morning before sunrise, the second just after noon, and the third in the late afternoon, the fourth immediately after sunset, and the fifth before retiring to bed. In strict doctrine, the five daily prayers cannot be waived even for the sick. They perform these prayers no matter what their situation or circumstance. These committed people pray five times a day, whether they are in an airplane, a subway, an office building, in the grocery store, or out on the street. By and large, we in the believing community are not as diligent. That is a statistical fact. Perhaps the, perhaps the words of Yeshua are applicable when he stated, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Luke 16, 8. The point is that Yahuwah also has a prayer schedule worthy of honor and worthy of being incorporated into our spiritual lives and activities. The Mohammedan Bible, called the Quran, which is little more than a corruption of the Holy Bible, requires that they pray only three times a day. Through the passing of time, however, the Muslims had added two extra hours to the biblical mandate, but the believing community has apparently deleted them altogether. We have res resorted to self-devised prayer schedules to fit our particular situations. Perhaps this is due in part to our not being aware of these biblical truths concerning the hours of prayer. Many believers have no standardized prayer system. In truth, we have been given a biblical system, but it has been, I have to say, grossly neglected. Conclusions. Prayer is meaningful at any hour of the day. But there is added significance when it is performed at the divinely appointed hours. The more divine order that we can restore to the body of Messiah, the more favor of Elohim we shall receive. The observance of these hours of prayer is not a matter of salvation, but matter, but a matter of order in the house of prayer for his people in our, in our assemblies and our gathering together and also in our prayer closets. That is just what I am added. That's my added emphasis. So you will read that in Isaiah 56, 7. Um, when the assemblies puts all these components of the biblical prayer system in place, it will see more of the blessings and approval of Elohim. Try it. Even if you do, even if you do get tossed into a den of lions for praying three times a day, You'll be in good prayer company and on the side of victory with Daniel, the prophet. That, when I read that, I was like, Father, wow. Thank you for giving this, this brother, um, for having him address this, because I have not heard. This is the first time I have read anything of this sort concerning the these hours, these appointed times or hours of prayer. And it just, I said, Father, what, what, are you, what are you showing me after you just revealed this to me and you led me to this brother? And I'm going to read some scripture too to, to give some, um, you know, out of the, out of the testimony and of two or three witnesses. says, shall his words be established? So I want to share some scripture evidence to, to what was shared, although he did give scripture, but I want to also share some myself. I said, what would you have me do, Father? He said, I want you to do these appointed hours of prayer. I said, okay. I said, how would you have me do that? He said, you set your, your phone. <laughs> we can use some of these devices that we know the enemy is meant for evil. We can use it for good. Um, he said, set your phone, the alarm, for 9 a.m., for 12 noon, and for 3 p.m. So that, that is what I've done. And um, when I'm in the middle of something, whatever, I, I just stop and I pray. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it's, it's not that I haven't been praying w without ceasing and praying in my prayer language throughout the day, because I have been. But there, I, I, I can't tell you what this is doing when I know that as soon as that alarm goes off, I'm on my knees and I'm before the Father in prayer. 
and I know it's something that he set up. And when it, when it is something that the Father has ordained and he has set up, there's something very special about it. And I would encourage you to really seek the Father in prayer and see what he's telling you. But I know as for me, this is going to be a part of my life as he's been calling me also into weekly fasting as a way of life. And he's increasing that and bringing me in, into greater discipline in that area as well, even more than what he's called me to do. So... I am not saying this so that you can be, so that we can be dogmatic and legalistic about anything. No, but there is an order, beloved. The Father has an order. He's not of the. He's not. He's not the Yahweh Elohim of confusion. Or disorder, but of peace. And when we have these certain orders set up in our life, these disciplines in our life, these spiritual disciplines. They bring us closer to the Father, to where we can hear His voice more clearly. And we can be a blessing and reach out and help others of our brothers and sisters and Messiah. So take a time of prayer. I love you all. And, um, I, oh yeah, let me go ahead and read. <laughs> let me read these scriptures to you. Um, Psalm 5, 7, it says, But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship toward your holy temple. Lead me, O Yahuwah, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. And in Psalm 55, 17 through 18, it says, Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and you will hear my voice, for you have redeemed my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. Selah, that one. Wow. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. I'm going to jump to, I mean, this, this was one of the scriptures that he gave the reference in Daniel 6, 10. And it says, Now when Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, interesting upper room, where have you heard that? the upper room, when the disciples were called to wait until they received power from on high. With his windows open toward Yerushalayim, he knelt, 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 he knelt down <laughs> on his knees. Yeah, sometimes when we're, we're kneeling, we feel like we're, we're kind of melting down into the in humility before Abba Father. So he knelt down on his knees three times that day and pray and give thanks before his Elohim, as was his custom since early days. So this is something he just didn't do that day, but it was his custom to do that since his early, he, he was probably taught that by his, his mother or his, his family, his father. Usually it's the mother, it says about, you know, honor the, the, the Torah from your mother. It's usually the mothers that have instructed their their children when it comes to the ways of the Father, you know, because they're with them all the time. Matthew 20, verse 5, it says, Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. Now this is talking about the man who went out from the vineyard looking to hire so it's interesting that it, they mention, it is mentioned the sixth and the ninth hour. You know, why wasn't he doing it the fourth or the, the fifth hour? You see the connection here, beloved. We know that the enemy has their numbers, but a lot of the things that the enemy uses when it comes to the numbers, it is what has been stolen from his children, stolen from us. You know, it says in scripture that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And that's not talking about monetary wealth. That's talking about things that they know have power, that the enemy knows about these things and they use it for wickedness. Well, they belong to us, to his children. What belongs to us is the third, the sixth, the ninth hour, these appointed time, these appointed hours of prayer to stop and pause Take time to pray. They belong to us, beloved. 
It's time we take it back. Okay, we're going to go to Matthew 27, 45 through 46. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the, all the land. And about the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is my Elohim, my Elohim, why have you forsaken me? Do you see the connection here? We're talking the sixth and the ninth hour. This is very important to our Abba Father, and if it's important to him, it needs to be important to us, what he's trying to convey and say. And I say in this ninth hour that we are in, probably not the ninth hour, I'd say, is when it was talking about the uh, the vineyard, he went to the those that were hanging around at the eleventh hour. So I'd say we're beyond the ninth hour, but we need to we need to be praying more vigilantly and setting up these times of appointed uh, prayers before the Father every day. Luke 1, verse 10, it says, And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Interesting. Do you notice how he said the hour of incense? That reminds me of Revelation when it says that our prayers go before the Father as incense. In, before in, in his nostrils. Uh, let me see if I can go ahead and find that. Uh, incense. I'm going to find that here. Because I want to read that. Prayers of incense. Okay. Let's see what we can come up with here. Here we go. It's in Revelation 8, verse 4. And it says, And the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, rose up before Elohim from the hand of the angel. Isn't that beautiful? Our prayers are like incense before our Abba Father. And then now I'm going to read uh, in... What have we got here? This is Acts 2.15. Let's read this first. It said, okay. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Oh, third hour. Are you, are you getting all this? They were there in the upper room. You talk about appointed prayer time. I thought about that as I was reading this, this scripture. How are we able, spread out all over throughout the earth, how are we able to come together? And he was telling me this is one of the ways that we can be brought into one accord. As we are praying, you know, there are things that we know in the world that if you celebrate certain holidays, oh, we're all doing it, we're all doing something together. And of course, his appointed feasts, which I love, that point to Messiah. When we do that, I know that there are others that are doing that and partaking in that as well. And we are in that one accord. We are, we are coming together as his body, whether we do it with those locally or we're doing it with everybody throughout the earth. And he, and I was, it was like, it just came to me, wow, Father, that if we yield to these appointed hours, this is a way that we're going to be doing it together throughout the earth. It's like being called to this this time of fasting that our brother Wally, I mean, it's something where we're all going to be coming together of one mind and one accord. You know, if a thousand, one can send a thousand to flight and two, how many, you know, uh, I should read that scripture. I'll, I'll, I'll have to maybe uh, see if I can reference that possibly in the description. But it, the, the scripture does say that the more, you know, when two or more come together, whatever we agree upon, it shall be granted of our Father in heaven. Can you imagine if more come together in agreement and we were all taking part in this appointed hour of prayer three times a day, how much that will bring unity? how much that will give us greater power over the principalities 
over the demonic strongholds that are increasing all the way around us? Something to, to ponder, beloved. Acts 3.1 Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Did you hear that? Okay, and now we're going to go to, I just have two more to read. And this is uh, Acts 10, 9 through 16. It says, The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. In fact, I don't need to read this because this is what I already read to you all before um, that led me on this this journey the Holy Spirit wanted me to read. So um, I, I already addressed that at the beginning. That was in uh, Acts 10, 9 through 16. And then, of course, Acts 10, 30 to uh, 33. So I'm going to put these scripture references in the description for you to go ahead and search it out and pray and ask the Father what he would show you concerning these appointed hours of prayer. Now I'm going to um, switch gears. I was going to do this in, in two videos, but for the truly so much that he's doing, so many things unfolding, so many things he's, he's having me do and getting ready to do, um, this is going to be put together just in, in one video. And I was reading... Let's see where I was. In Psalms. Let me see if we can go there, beloved. So what is today? Today is the... So I guess it would say, because I, I read, I read uh, like five Psalms a day and, and a Proverbs, and he leads me in a place and reading the, 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 uh, the Gospels and, and uh, also reading in Acts that uh, we're doing with the Book of Acts study with our Miss Celeste on Friday nights. So when I was in reading in Psalm 19, this is what jumped out at me. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. And I was really pondering on that. So I wanted to go ahead and look and see what some of the commentaries that I had um, downloaded onto my sword and the one that really really spoke to me and I want to read because it's just it's, it's really just a beautiful uh, commentary on on this very scripture it says instruction to be derived from the revolution of day and night and I'm not too sure who this uh, commentary is from it says capital B and then L I don't know if it's Barnes commentary I, I don't really know yet I tried looking for it and I just didn't have enough time to really dig into that deeper to find out who it was. So um, I'm just going to say BL. <laughs> the almighty power of the creator and preserver of the universe, the very act of creation or the producing of any being out of nothing, gives us the most enlarged idea of omnipotence. The almighty not only at first created but continually upholds the work of his hands. His mighty energy is continu continually displayed in the preservation of all the creatures he has made. The goodness of Elohim attend particularly to man, the noblest work of our Yahuwah. Every faculty of our nature and every circumstance of our condition afford abundant evidence of the goodness of Elohim. Through the faculty of reason, we are blessed with moral perception. We know what is right and what is wrong. The exercise of our mental powers is accompanied with pleasure in the scheme of redeeming grace unfolded in the gospel. We have the most illustrious display of the divine benign, benignity which men or angels have ever witnessed. And if we consider ourselves as creatures in a state of trial, we find ourselves furnished, furnished with all the direction, assistance, and encouragement that such a state requires. Three, the wisdom of Yah Wisdom, whenever it is employed, must have happiness for its object. And when that is promoted by fit means, wisdom shows itself to the utmost advantage. Every object that contributes to our happiness is admirably contrived for that end. And every evidence of the divine goodness brings with it a con 
concomitant proof of divine wisdom. The body and the mind want the rest of night and partake of this refreshment. The faculties of the soul cannot long bear intense application. Attend now the, the spiritual and moral instructions which this subject suggests. Let every revolution of day and night raise our thoughts to Elohim. Let us attend to the daily revolution, not with the coldness of philosophic inquirer, but with the ardent piety and devout worshippers of Elohim of nature and grace. But it is in the scheme of redemption unfolded in the gospel that we behold the divine perfection shining with the most resplendent luster. The light of the sun of righteousness throws new beauty upon the creation of Elohim. Two, consider the experience we have had of the power, goodness, wisdom, and mercy of Elohim by the past of our life. It were, it were endless to enumerate the instances of divine goodness and mercy in which we have shared. Three, every revolving year, every, every revolving day, tells us that the period of our probation is hastening to an end. Then watch against a worldly temper of disposition of mind. Watch against building our hopes on general truths and promises without any evidence of our interest in them. Silent sounds. It sounds rather curious, does it not, to hear about one day speaking to another? Though you have listened ever so hard, yet you have not been able to hear a day speaking. That is true. And David, who wrote the psalm, knew that also, for he says in the very next sense, no speech, no language. Their voice is not heard, and yet, day unto day, utter speech. How can that be? Because there are more ways of speaking than one. There is the way the deaf and dumb speak on their fingers. Their voice is not heard, yet they speak. Then a book speaks. The moment it is open and you see the words, you understand what they mean. They speak to you. There is a tribe of savage people far away. And what do you think is the name they give to the book? They call it the Whisperer. But it does not whisper. It has no voice nor sound, and yet it speaks. Now how do you come to understand what people say when they speak on their fingers? Or how do you ever come to know what a book says? Isn't it by first learning how to understand? And you carry the way to understand inside yourself. So is it that we understand thousands of things round about us. And that tells us of Elohim. The way, then, to understand what the days speak is to get much of Yah's spirit into our hearts. The days say there's nothing new. Today is just like yesterday. Yesterday came out beautiful, became brighter, had clouds and sunshine, and then faded away. So it will be today. Yesterday carried away on its white wings the spirits of thousands of men and women, and we children, little children too, and the night came and covered their bodies, and they were seen no more. So it will be today. There's nothing new, but as you listen again, you hear the day say. Two, everything is new. There is nothing new about the day, but everything is new about you. The temptations you will have today won't be the same that you had yesterday. The night has come like a black wall between you and yesterday, and today you get a fair start again. I'm um, Just as a side note, that reminds me of the scripture that says, the steadfast love of our Lord never ceases, and his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And today you may do better than yesterday, or today you may do worse, but you can't blame yesterday. It's gone. This is a new day. But take care. You will be tempted today in another way, so you can't afford to forget Yeshua. A new me day means a new way and only Yeshua can guide you rightly upon it. But this also the days say, time tells of eternity. That's number three. As the days pass away, we pass away with them. Passing away out into eternity, when you are in a train or a tram car, you notice that all the people do not go to the journey's end. Some go only, go only a little way, others go farther. New ones come in, perhaps you yourself get out before the whole journey is done. Anyway, they are very few who go all the way. It is just the same with our lives. Some only go a short distance through the days. Yahweh calls them away when they are young. Some go a little further. Others a little further still. But they are very few indeed who come to be very old. 
shouldn't every day, then, make us think of what is to be the end of all? Night unto night shows knowledge, the teaching of the night. God divided the sovereignty of time between day and night. Night teaches the individuality of our being. For more than the day, it shows us what is to be alone with ourselves and our Elohim. It drives all the faculties and sensibilities of the soul inward upon itself. The hours of darkness are fearful to those who are afraid to be with themselves and with Yahuwah Elohim, our Abba Father. Yeshua used to retire to desert places that he might during the night time be alone with the Father. I have myself spent the hours of night alone upon high mountains, a solemn experience. Two, the retirement of the soul, in which Yahuwah's presence is most felt, need not take us away from the crowded paths of life, where we see most of man, there we can see most of Elohim. A spiritually minded man or woman once said that he spiritually minded man once said that he felt Yah's presence with him in walking the crowded and noisy streets of New York as really as he did in the sanctuary or in the solemn hour of devotion. I will digress a little and say that I can say the same thing. That no matter where I'm going, I take that prayer closet with me. I take that sense of his presence wherever I go. And can have that solemnity and, and have that sense of him in such a way, whether I'm here in this room or I'm driving or elsewhere, because it's becoming such a part of my life that it doesn't stop here. I mean, there's amazing things that happen in my prayer closet, but that sense of his presence, that sense of and awe of him wherever I go does not cease, but continues to abound in my own life. Three, the night of the natural world is the symbol of the deeper night of sorrow and disappointment that settles down upon the soul. He always surrounds us with both that we may feel for his hand in the darkness and find ourselves safe with his protection. We learn from the night of affliction and trouble many lessons which we can never master in the light of broad day. In the awful night hour of death, we need not find ourselves alone. He has been all the way through the valley of the shadow of death, and he will not leave us to grope in vain for his hand. Ah, that just, beloved, that so blessed me, that reading, and the depth of that. Um, this commentary was, uh, I believe, written in the 1800s. Such wisdom from a lot of these brothers and sisters who walked in that deeper understanding of the things of the spirit of our father and we can we can glean so much from that and i pray that this reading blessed you and i just want to let you all know that i love you our abba father loves you even more than i can ever love you and uh I think I want to go ahead and, and um, share this song. It is a, uh, get my guitar, hold on. It's a song called, uh, Were You There When They Crucified the Lord, our Lord? It's a, uh, it's a hymn, and it gave me a, a, a verse to that. I mean, I could go find it and, and, and sing the ones that were given, but this is just what he wanted me to do and um, personalize it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Were you there? No, here it goes. I wasn't there when they crucified you Lord I wasn't there when they crucified you Lord oh, sometimes it makes me want to tremble 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 
isn't there when they crucified the Lord. I thank you for what you did on that cross at Calvary. There's my talk about prayer. Okay, this is perfect. Just so you all know that it was 3 o'clock, my alarm went off. <laughs> I'm probably going to keep this in and start it just so you know that this is my time, Father. I thank you for this ninth hour, this appointed time. What a, what a perfect example that my alarm went off at this time as I'm doing this recording. I thank you so very much for the way that you love us and you want to bring us deeper and deeper into your heart, into your presence. And at this time, at this ninth hour, that, Father, I submit and yield to you in prayer. I pray for all those of our, our who are suffering greatly in Texas because of this storm that has caused much of the electricity go out. People are freezing. They're without food, they're without water. And it's not only just in Texas, it's happening in Oklahoma and places in Oregon. Not where I'm at in Oregon, but other further up. Father, it's happening throughout. We're seeing this, these judgments that you are allowing, the judgments that are coming through our land. And you're trying to open up our eyes and get our attention. And this is a time, Father, for your people to rally around together and see what it, ever, what, it, what it is that they need to do, how they need to pray, how they need to be able to reach out and help those who have need, those animals who, have, who need us. We need to help these of our suffering brothers and sisters and even those lost who you are yet to bring them to salvation and Messiah with an example of love that they will see amongst us, your people, reaching out everywhere that even if they are causing it, or whatever the cause is, that it's an opportunity, Father, to be those witnesses and to bear your fruit and help those who are suffering just as they would want, we would want them to help us. But you said, we need to do unto others as we would want them to do for us. So help us in every way to reach out and show us what we need to do, what we can give what resources we have, what we can offer, what things have been stored up. I just thank you for that, Father, for hearing this prayer and for rallying your people together to help in this time of great, great need and urgency. I ask this in your most holy name and by the blood of Yeshua, your will be done. I thank you for what you did on that cross at Calvary. You shed your blood, Lord, for my sins. And you did rescue me from the power of death. Hell and the grave. I wasn't there when they nailed you to that tree. I wasn't there when they nailed you to that tree. me want to tremble, tremble, oh tremble. I wasn't there when they nailed you on that tree. I thank you for what 
You did on that cross at Calvary. You shed your blood, Lord, for my sins. And you did rescue me from the power of death. Hell and the grave Oh, I love you Oh, I thank you For what you did On that cross for me Oh, I praise you Thank you for what you did, Lord, for me on Calvary. Amen, beloved. Before I um I'm going to share a song from a sister. She re she wants to remain anon anonymous. I asked her to call me so that I can record the song that was given to her by the Holy Spirit. And the reason why it is important for me to share it with you, it um, is I had shared in one of the videos that the Father wants to give us songs. doesn't matter if you feel like you can sing or can't sing. If you ask him, he will give you a song. So this sister was asking the father, asking for a new song. And he gave her one. And he's been giving her more since, you know, ask of the father. He wants to give you these songs. He wants to raise up your, your frequency in him, higher in him. And that's what worship will do. That's what these songs, when you utter them and, and sing, to, sing them, okay? And the air waves, it, it breaks through the demonic frequencies and... and um, does mighty works, and we need to be doing it more and more, beloved. So I want to share this song with you before, before I close. Feather cover me far and I can see Rejoicing in the mercy you wrap me in this morn. Protection, gentle though your wings, I'm safe to praise you as I sing. Oh, my loving Father, oh, my mighty God, oh, my other Father, oh, my daddy God. Thank you, Lord, forever, and now for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for resting me quiet in this storm. Feather cover me as far as I can see, rejoicing in the mercy you wrap me in. Protection, gentle though your wings, I'm safe to praise you as I sing. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Your eyes on the sparrow and your hand is never late. Glory, glory, hallelujah. So the path grows narrow, you guide me through. 